All right, today we're going to cover a big topic, vasculitis. Let's go through a case. A 37-year-old woman with a history of asthma presents with dyspnea, abdominal pain. She was diagnosed with asthma at age 19 and has had exacerbations with increasing frequency over the past several years, despite the use of a maximum dose of a fluticasone inhaler. Over the past few weeks, she's also had increasing episodes of abdominal pain after eating large meals. And yesterday morning, she noted that her left foot seems to be dragging a bit. She also reports fevers, a 15-pound weight loss, but she denies any coughing or sore throat or diarrhea. On review of systems, we also find that she's reporting a rash on both of her elbows. No eye pain, no redness, no joint pain. She's a non-smoker, she drinks socially, occasionally uses crack cocaine. Family history is non-contributory. So that's a lot of information. Let's try and at least highlight four particular variables that we always do. Number one, the time course. This is a complicated time course. On the one hand, we've got something that's been going on since she was 19 for 20 years. That's some increasing asthma exacerbations that have been gradually increasing over time. But then we've got some new symptoms starting a few weeks ago. And then we've got thing, things that just started yesterday morning. So I'd call this an acute on subacute on chronic kind of picture. Next up, the pattern of disease. We've got a lot of systems involved here. We've got the lungs, some abdominal pain suggests a gastrointestinal issue, the left foot drop, maybe that's a neurologic issue, and then a rash on the elbows. So clearly a lot of different systems are involved. Evidence of joint inflammation. At this point, it's not entirely clear. We'll need a physical exam, but she's not highlighting any joint pain or fusions at the moment. And next up, systemic involvement. Well, the fevers and the weight loss certainly make us think about a systemic involvement issue. And of course, she has four or five systems already involved just based on our HPI. Now let's go into our physical exam. We do see that she has a temperature of 38.2 degrees Celsius, so she is in fact febrile. Heart rate is tacky at 102, blood pressure looks okay, and she is satting well on room air. Normal sclera, no lymphadenopathy, the examiner does note some nasal polyps. She's tachycardic, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops, and we do find some focal crackles up in the right upper lung field. There is some dullness to percussion also at the left base. Something's going on in multiple lung fields. Her abdomen reveals a soft, non-distended belly, though she is mildly tender over the epigastrium. And then in the neuromuscular exam, we find three out of five strength at the left ankle with dorsiflexion, though two plus refluxes throughout, except one plus at the left ankle. Her skin and nail exam reveals some subcutaneous nodules with, erith with erythema and palpable purpura on the bilateral arms at the extensor surfaces, a little bit more on the left than on the right. That is a lot of data. So which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis? Is it granulomatosis with polyangiitis? Is it microscopic polyangiitis? Is it anti-glomerular basement membrane disease? Or is it polyarteritis nodosa? Boy, that is a lot of big words. Let's take a quick look at the classification of the vasculitides so that we aren't completely lost in all of those syllables. All right, first off, what is a vasculitis? So all the vasculitides are just a group of autoimmune, multi-system diseases that can affect all ages, from infants up to elderly patients. All of these vasculitides, however, are characterized by leukocytic inflammation of the vascular walls. That's the primary defect. What that causes, though, is a variety of downstream problems, which are all caused by either luminal narrowing, which is gonna cause downstream tissue ischemia, aneurysmal dilatations, which is one of the most significant features that we see in polyarteritis nodosa, or you may see vessel wall damage, which is gonna to lead to red blood cells seeping into the skin, which can cause hemorrhage or petechiae. In terms of the language here, a hemorrhage of a small vessel leads to petechiae, which is anything smaller than three millimeters in size on the skin, whereas anything larger that leads to a larger lesion greater than three millimeters, we call that an ecchymosis. Now keep in mind that with ongoing granulocytic inflammation of the vessel wall, you're gonna get lesions that are more indurated and full and therefore palpable. Now, once you've earned the term palpable purpura, you've gotta make sure you're thinking about vasculitis because that's the one thing that's gonna cause that. All right, next up, remember that all the specific vasculitis subtypes that we're gonna go through are essentially divided based on the pathology you find under biopsy 
and the distribution of the affected vessels. Where are the lesions occurring, whether it's small, medium, or large? The other factors to think about with vasculitis is that most of them are primary, but a number of them can occur secondary to other disease processes. And lastly, all of them are completely idiopathic. We don't really know what causes them, though we know a lot of different things that are associated with particular subtypes of vasculitis. All right, so here's a huge schematic showing all the different types of vasculitis all on one slide. Initially, we break up the vasculitis types into small, medium, and large vessel vasculitis. Looking over at the small vessel vasculitis group first, we can see that it's further broken up into two larger groups, immune complex mediated, and ANCA-associated. The ANCA-associated group is also called posse immune which simply means that there is not any evidence or any significant evidence of immune complex on the pathologic biopsy of these lesions. The immune complex mediated, if you perform biopsies and look at the lesions, you're going to find lots of immune complexes there. And that group includes cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, IgA vasculitis, and anti-glomerular basement membrane vasculitis. The ANCA-associated group, again, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, microscopic polyangiitis, and granulomatosis polyangiitis. Those three lesions on the bottom we're going to talk about more in detail. All of them are associated with ANCA positivity on serum testing. Moving on to our medium vessel group, that's only two significant diseases we have to be mindful of there, and that's polyarteritis nodosa, which is depicted there in our renal arteriography, and then Kawasaki's disease. And then moving on to our last category, large vessel vasculitis, that's going to be giant cell arteritis and Takayasu's vasculitis. All right, so we're back here with our differential diagnosis. And we can see that our first three choices are all ANCA-associated small vessel vasculitides. Again, EGPA, GPA, and MPA. Incidentally, a little sidebar, you'll note that after the pathologic name, you'll see a name in parentheses, and that's, of course, an eponym giving homage to some prior physician who discovered the disease. Oftentimes, those prior people are of ill repute, and we've attempted to discard those names over the past five or ten years. Instead, those prior eponymous descriptions of the disease have been replaced with information in the name that is more indicative of the actual underlying disease process and what you would find on pathology. So, with that caveat, let's move forward. So as I said, the first three are ANCA-associated small vessel vasculitides, and then we've got anti-GBM disease, also a small vessel vasculitide, but it is immune complex mediated. And then lastly, polyarteritis nodosa, which is one of the medium vessel vasculitis.